All right. Hi, everyone. Um, I think we'll get started. Um, so it's my pleasure today to introduce uh, our this week's colloquium speaker, Steve Kidder uh, from CUNY City College of New York and Graduate Center. So uh, I've known Steve, Steve a number of years now. I, I think he's a consummate observer. Um, he is just a, amazing at going out in the field or looking uh, in thin section and making observations and thinking about what they mean um, for largely processes deeper in the crust or even in our mantle. And so uh, I think today Steve is going to be talking about how squishy is the middle crust. Steve comes to us uh, before he was at City College. He was, he got his undergrad at University of Minnesota. He then spent time at University of Arizona and he got his PhD from Caltech. And then he also spent time as a postdoc, as an NSF um, international postdoctoral fellow in New Zealand, working on the Alpine Fault. So uh, he has a really diverse set of experiences working in the field, in the lab, and also doing uh, experiments to try to understand uh, things like the deep, deep earthquake cycle and then deformation of the crust. Okay, so with that, uh, we're looking forward to it, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. I got, I have two laser pointers here. Um, right, so, let's see. I'm trying to advance a slide which worked previously, and now it's not. Okay. Okay. There we go. Okay. Right. So, uh, previously, before coming to New York, I was a year and a half in New Zealand, and these are some pictures from related to the Christchurch earthquakes that happened there in 2010 and 2011, and those that happened. Uh, a year or two before I got there and were in the next town north of where I was living. And New Zealand, I was there because New Zealand is an active tectonic location, but Christchurch was supposedly on the, the, safer, the safe side of the island. Um, and these, the, the magnitude and the damage of these earthquakes was, was a big surprise for people living in New Zealand and the impact on the society was, was uh, very significant. Um, so for somebody st like myself studying uh, rock deformation, uh, this, these events were a, a humbling reminder of how little we actually know about a lot of processes in the earth. And another great, another unfortunately, uh, unfortunate example of that would be the Toho Shuoku earthquake that happened later in 2011, right? Which was much larger than anticipated. So these, um, the, the work I'm going to be describing is, falls under the category of rheology. And the pitch drop experiment, which is shown here, is a, is a classic rheology experiment that can help us understand some, of the, some key concepts in, um, in rheology. So pitch is uh, at room temperature, it's a solid. If you hit it with a hammer, it will, it'll fracture and break like glass. About 100 years ago, uh, an Australian man heated up pitch, poured it into this funnel, let it cool down to room temperature, and then, and then broke off the bottom of the funnel. And about every 10 years or so since then, it, it, it drips. So uh, pitch, like rocks in the middle or deep crust um, behaves um, as a viscous fluid over long time scales. Um, and so, so it's an example like, like rocks where at different time scales it has different properties. Um, and I haven't checked on this on the pit drop experiment lately, but there, there's a webcam if you want to watch it. Okay, so 
Yeah, so pitch is a, it, at least on a human time scale, is a high, what we could call a high viscosity, very high viscosity fluid. And by viscosity, I'm referring to differential stress, and I'm using um, sigma for that, uh, divided by the strain rate. And differential stress is uh, the difference between, I in three dimensions, oftentimes materials are experiencing like more, more, more force in one direction than another. And, that, and that's that the difference between the, lar between the largest component of stress and the smallest is what we call differential stress. And that's what causes things to, to twist or bend. Um, and it's different from the pressure, for example, of just burial or sub being submerged in water where things are just getting, just kind of being pressed on in all directions. So differential stress is what causes, you know, mountain building and faulting. Uh, and so that divided by uh, strain rate. And I'll talk about strain rate. It's like how quickly the deformation is happening. Okay, so this, this topic of uh, rheology, which is, I haven't defined yet, but rheology is, uh, actually if you Google rheology, it's more, there's more hits in the food industry because it's, about, it's the things like, okay, if, is your ketchup too runny or is it, you know, have the right consistency. So rocks have rheology as well. Um, and it's the relationship between the, the forces that are applied and what, what happens to them in terms of their, their shape and location. Um, so, if, so this is a very, this is a topic that underlies a lot of aspects of the earth sciences. Um, so the fact that we even have plate, plates, tectonic plates is a, is a function of their rheology. So, uh, rocks are able to localize deformation and that creates the boundaries of what we have as plates. So it's a, it's a really fundamental aspect. Um, it controls like the, you know, the heights of mountains or the, how quickly glaciers flow. That's all, that's all in the, the sort of area of rheology, rock rheology. Um, so I've shown here, this is a, a cross section of Taiwan. I'll be showing a number of, a lot of this talk is based on work I did in Taiwan. Um, this, you may be able to make out there's a, there's a, a, f a fold in the rocks here. So it's, um, and it's coming from the sort of a central area of Taiwan. And uh, so the, the goal of the work that I'm describing is to try to uh, use, use samples to under, rock samples to understand um, the, the stresses and the, st and, the, and the viscosities of rocks, basically. Um, so we're trying to understand rheology better, um, partly because the rheology of the middle crust, because this is the area where the largest earthquakes nucleate, nucleate. and it's also the, the characteristics of the middle crust, which is about maybe 10, depends where you are, but maybe starting about 10 kilometers down, uh, the, the, the properties of that, of that part of the crust are, uh, stop earthquakes from going any deeper. So that controls the area of the ruptures and the sizes of the earthquakes. So it's a, it's a kind of a critical uh, region. And, uh, and the rheology of the middle crust, much like the rheology of the lithosphere in general, is uh, it's sort of a weak link in our understanding of, of uh, crustal dynamics. Um, so Many different approaches are, have been taken to a better understand middle crustal rheology or the rheology of the crust in general. So we've, we've drilled holes uh, several kilometers down. We look at, and we can measure things like the, the, the hole that we drill will start to, defo will start to change shape um, over time. And that gives us some, some understanding of the deformation of the rocks. We look at satellite images and GPS measurements of how the, how the crust is moving over time. And we can also uh, put bits of samples into machines and, and press on them and see what happens. So these are all methods that have, have been used to better understand uh, crustal rheology. And they all have downsides. The drill cores are often extremely expensive and can't really get down as far as we'd like in a lot of cases. Uh, the 
satellite and GPS-based constraints often, often struggle to distinguish even like which processes are happening. So for example, can we explain some motions be because there's a fault and things are moving on either side of it, or is it because this whole area is kind of deforming more, more in a more spread out way? Like, so that's hard enough versus kind of trying to find quantitative relationships that describe the, the, um, the viscosity. And oftentimes, well, in general, the, the rock deformation experiments take place a uh, million to a billion times faster than what's occurring in the Earth. So there's a lot of extrapolation that has to occur there. So the, the classical summary diagram in a lot of papers on a crustal rheology is the, um, it's called the strength depth diagram and I'll use strength and stress interchangeably. I'm going to move that pointer. Uh, So these show, typically for the, near the surface, there's a, a linear relationship, and that has to do with uh, the fact that on, on faults, uh, which are more common at the surface, the, as you increase pressure, squeezing on the fault, it becomes just increasingly hard to move the fault. So that, that dominates the behavior of, of rocks for some distance down until they get warm enough that other things start to, ta to take over and the rocks weaken and that's the curvy part here and you can see the curve. And these, are, these are different, all at the same scale, uh, ideas about, or hypotheses about what, how, how the crust strength changes with depth. And you can see that there's a lot of variation and also even in areas that you know, are labeled the same, continents, there's major disagreements in terms of is most of the strength in the, in the crust? Is it in the mantle? Is, the is there strength in the lower crust? Is there not? Uh, there's, these things just aren't very well known and there's probably a lot of uh, variation from place to place. So the goal here is to try to, I'm gonna be describing a, a research on a tool that, to try to help us better understand and make these kinds of constraints. Okay, so another approach, approach to rheology, rock rheology, is using naturally deformed samples. So this is a, these are some conglomerates from the Canadian Shield that have been deformed uh, to different, different amounts. So conglomerates, there are rocks, right, that have, there's chunks of different material, you know, granite, some basalt, different things in there. And, uh, what we can do with these, with these, these situations is we can, we can see that, you can see maybe that a lot of these have been sort of stretched out. Uh, so their aspects ratio have increased with increasing strain. Some of them get very stretched. Some of them are resistant to the deformation, right? So we can look at the ratios of, you know, how much one composition is, is deforming versus another, and that can give us some, some, some information. Um, one of the downsides of this approach is that we often don't know how long it took for this to happen. So if we're trying to calculate a viscosity, we need to know the time scale. And these, uh, these traditionally these studies, these rocks are from the Canadian Shield. They're maybe 2.7 2 billion years old. And we don't know if that deformation occurred over 10,000 years or 10 million years. And that, that translates to a couple orders of magnitude of uncertainty in the viscosity of these rocks. So, so the approach that, I'm, that I focus on is trying to do that kind of work using, using what's, what's called uh, natural experiments. So Earth conducted the experiment and our job is to, is to figure out what, what the experiment was, right? Um, so the best place to do this is a place like Taiwan or where I'll talk about New Zealand, New Zealand again, uh, where the, the experiment is still happening. So Taiwan is a re results from the collision of a, of a chain of, an, of volcanoes against the, the Chinese continental margin. And that, ha that collision occurred something like six million years ago, and it's ongoing. So we can use, uh, we can measure using, for example, GPS, the rates of, of motion, and 
compare that to rocks that have been deep in the, in the Taiwan orogenic wedge, but then have been eroded to the surface in the last you know, million years or so, uh, to make the best constraints we possibly can about uh, th those rocks. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about uh, how we constrain the, basically the different ingredients for calculating viscosity of some rocks. So how do we calculate, how do we measure stress in rocks? How do we estimate strain rates? How do we figure out, it's important, okay, if we know the viscosity, that's great, but if we don't know what temperature that, that the rock was deformed at, it's, it doesn't do us much good. So we need to be able to, f to find rock samples and figure out what, what the conditions were when they were being deformed. And then uh, basically checking, trying, trying a bunch of techniques and then checking against uh, some known um, estimates of rock rheology. Okay, so we'll start with, with a stress estimate. So paleo piezometry, piezometry is measuring stress. So we're, we're the, the, the task is to estimate stresses that existed in the past and using, using rock samples. So I'll be talking about, there's, there's many different ways that people have tried and continue to try to do this. I'll be talking about one of the more popular ways, although it's definitely a, not a, a really widespread thing um, in geology, but the recrystallized grain size piezometer is what I'll be talking about. So when this is an experimental sample that I deformed. So this is a quartz, a quartzite, and I heated it up to around 900 degrees, and I squeezed it uh, until it, over a course of maybe two days, in the in an instrument at Brown University. And you can see that the there there's change. It doesn't look the same, right? Some of the the, the grains have become elongate, and there's also a population of these small grains, and uh, those grains are forming because of the presence of what are, what are called dislocations. So dislocations are, are linear defects in crystalline solids. So the analogy is, is, is a big heavy carpet that, that you wanted to move. And so you could, you could call a few of your friends and each pick up an end and, and, and lift it. Another way to move it is to introduce a little in the go to the corner and introduce a little bump and then kind of push the bump across. You can do that all by yourself and it'll take a lot less energy. So the crystals are full of these dislocations and, and, it's, and they're coming in and out of the, of the board. That's the linear aspect of them. So a, a typical cubic centimeter of, of quartzite has 10,000 kilometers of dislocation in it. So they're, it's, they're, they're um, essential components of, any, of crystals when they're any kind of crystal that's deforming. And the presence of the dislocations in their, in their heterogeneous distribution causes these little grains to form that are called recrystallized grains. There's a, a TEM photo of um, showing some dislocations. Okay, so these, these little grains form when, you, when rocks are at at high temperatures, and this happens in metals and ceramics and other things as well. Uh, uh, these little grains form, and if you do a whole bunch of experiments, so each dot on here is a different experiment, there's a correlation, inverse correlation, between the, the size of their crystallized grains, so, th so bigger grains, this would, be, this would be, you know, 70 microns diameter, and the stress that was applied in the experiment. So the, the harder you push on the sample, the finer the grains are. And, the, and you can think about that, that makes a sort of intuitive sense if you think about um, when you're putting a lot of stress on it, you're applying a lot of energy to the sample. And the formation of grain boundaries is, is a, it takes a lot of energy. To, it, it's, um, and so a fine grain sample has a lot of grain boundaries, another way to look at it. So you're pump putting a lot of energy in at these fine grains um, and high stresses. Okay, so I, ca I did some experiments as well. So all the experiments we were just looking at were done at, uh, at a constant stress. But we know that stress can vary in, in, the, in nature, right? So I did a number of experiments to, 
to, to see what would happen if we, we did experiments where we changed the stress during the experiment to try to be a little bit more realistic and find out, okay, well, since most of our rocks probably were experiencing changing stresses, like, you know, we should we continue to, to be using this, this, this tool? And so a lot of these, these are the colored uh, symbols, a lot of these fall along the previous relationship, and there's some exceptions. So in cases where, where stress, there was a, a jump in stress to higher stresses, uh, I found a bimodal distribution. So there was an earlier population of grains, these larger ones that correspond to the lower stress conditions. And then if you zoom in, you can see tiny little grains associated with the higher stress in the later phase of the experiment. So in this case, we could actually, dis uh, these samples told us about the stress history. We were able to measure you know, and quantify both the earlier and the later stress. So the complicated stress relationship there actually was, was useful. In the case of, of stress decreasing, uh, I found that the recrystallized grain size starts out small and then it increases over time. And, but there's a sort of a trademark microstructure in the, in the samples, which is this, what's called a foam texture. So you can see these uh, relatively straight gra grain boundaries and roughly 120 degree triple junctions. That those are indications of grains that are growing. Um, and they, the reason they're growing is to minimize the energy of, their, of the, the boundaries. The boundaries take, take energy, so if it's warm and nothing's happening, they, they, will just, they will just grow. So we have an indication of this, in this case, if we find a sample that shows this kind of thing, we'll, we would say, okay, this sample was experiencing a, likely experiencing a, a decrease in stress. And we can still use the grain size to put a, a boundary on the stress conditions. And we also uh, uh, did some experiments where we, we gradually increased the stress, which is, is probably, for most samples that are, kinda, that are coming up from deep levels, like on a fault, they're gonna experience increasing stress as they get, uh, as, they, as they're cooling off. And so we scaled those to natural uh, 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 locations. And those are these two, which felt fell quite a ways off of the, the relationship here. Um, but they did show, again, some, some characteristics like a wider distribution of grains that might help us um, identify such things in, in the field. So in terms of uh, the sort of detour into, well, what if, what if uh, we don't have steady state? It seems that, we, that from these limited experiments, and we need more, but uh, we can often still make quantitative determinations or eliminate samples that we shouldn't be, we shouldn't mess with. That's the, the sort of the takeaway from those experiments. Okay, so then the question is, can we, if we, if we just find a, a quartzite on the ground somewhere, or an outcrop in Taiwan, can we use this relation, does this relationship that we've developed in the laboratory really apply to a natural sample from the earth. And this, because if it, if it does, this is like a really easy tool to, to use. It does, you just need to make thin sections and you need an optical microscope. So there's a lot of opportunity there if, if we trust it. And I, and I don't see this, this, this approach being used as widely as I would, as it, as it, as it could be. Um, particularly outside of the structural geology community. So there are people that are, we're, we're drilling, you know, million dollar holes in the ground to try to, to, try to figure out what the stress levels are. Um, you know, there may be some simpler ways uh, of establishing or adding to this data, for example, for creating numerical models of, of mountain building and so forth. So part of my motivation is to, to, to kind of determine like well how, how how what's the uncertainty on using the grains on the grain size here to estimate a stress so the study area in Taiwan is from it's in central Taiwan and I collected a lot a number of samples along uh, a road there that crosses a, a mountain range called the Shuishan range and the Shuishan range is basically three uh, 
fault bounded blocks in it. Uh, I collected quartz that was in, in a quartzite and also veins of quartz in different, in different things to find out if, does it matter the location of the quartz that's recrystallized, does it matter you know, if it's found in, in a vein or not in a vein or that sort of thing, like how important is that? So the data are here in terms of the grain size in their geographic location. Uh, the colors are different, are different quartz from different veins. I don't see much difference between the quartzite and the veins. And down here uh, is an indication of peak temperature. So the, the different blocks uh, came from different depths. So this, the block on the, on the right here has some of the higher temperatures samples and also has the coarser grain sizes. The lower temperature area has much finer grain sizes, which, which indicate higher stresses. And that makes, that's consistent with just everyday experience of like when things are warmer, they're easier to, uh, to manipulate, right? You can, you can bend metal easier if it's warm. If you're you know, making a sword or something, you heat it up and then you can pound on it with a hammer and it, and it changes its shape. So the same thing, that's what we're seeing here. We're seeing colder, uh, higher stress. Um, so at least in, it's, it's going in the right direction. And that kind of thing has been seen before. Um, and one of the things we're going to be coming to is Taiwan is not only is it an active, an active place where we can um, better constrain some of the things I'll be talking about in a moment, like strain rate. Uh, but there's also independent estimates of stress. So I'm going to come back to these stress estimates in a, in a, in a few minutes. Do what time this talk started? Uh, it, we got going a little late, but... Maybe five minutes late? Yeah. Okay. All right. So I'm going to move on to... So we want to calculate a viscosity for these rocks. So that was stress divided by strain rate. So strain rate's is the next thing here for these rocks. So strain rate, um, so strain is taking something and changing its shape. Uh, so if you, if you take something and you double its length and you do that in a million years, you would, we would call that a strain rate of one per million year. Um, if, you, if you do that in 100 million years, it'd be point, point zero 0.01 per million year. The Experiments that I described, uh, which took about a day or two, are, were, were in the neighborhood of a, mil uh, a million to a billion per million years. And the, the pitch drop experiment, which incidentally is the longest continually running experiment, has, even then, it's, a, it's around 10,000 per million year. So, we can constrain strain rates, uh, oh, and I should just, just to point out, yeah, so these are sort of what we expect geologic rates to be, things taking around a million, a million years, 10 million, that sort of neighborhood. <coughs> so if we go, if we, if we look at some of this, the, the quartzite samples in the Shueishan range, uh, we, this, this, the bedding plane is, is not the direction you're seeing here. So this, this is strain, they've been, they've been squished. Um, and we know uh, from the age of the sediments or the sediments that were turned into this rock in the, in the cooling history that there was about uh, three and a half million years time window when this could have happened. So we could, to get a, a minimum strain rate, we can take the, the strain around a third and divide it by three and a half million years. And we can get a maximum strain rate looking at the the, the rates of deformation from GPS. So we can see it's currently happening that um, on the East Coast versus the West Coast, there's a, um, about four centimeters of year, a year shortening. If we, for a maximum, a maximum estimate, if we put all that into this, into this area and, and squeezed on it, we would get something about 2.2 2 per million year. So as these, are act, these are some of the best constraints on strain rate in, in middle crustal rocks that I'm aware of. And if we take the stresses that I showed you earlier and divide them by the strain rate, we get something like uh, a sextillion 
pascal seconds. And then to put that into context, uh, water is about a thousandth pascal second. Basalt, a basalt lava can vary quite a bit, but uh, around a thousand. The pitch, the pitch drop experiment has a viscosity at room temperature of, what is that, 100 million? Um, so I like to think about, in this case, the difference between, just to kind of get a sense of, I guess it's about geologic time, but in, in some ways, but the difference in viscosity between water and pitch is the same as between pitch and these rocks. So at, um, from this perspective of the rocks, the pitch flows like, like your faucet. Okay, so we have a viscosity estimate and we want to estimate temperature, not, not just what was the temperature, what was the hottest the rocks hit, which is often what we, we know. We want to know the temperature when they were being deformed. So we have a, a history of temperature. We, they were deposited at the surface. Um, they heated up. There was a, this collision happened, and then they've cooled down. But there's this window in here of quite a bit of 200 degrees, basically, of uncertainty that we'd like to narrow down. We don't. We know that. So dislocations don't move around in quartz above, if the temperature is below around 250 or 300 degrees. So we, that's, so we have that constraint, but we want to do a little better. Um, and I showed here, there's, yeah, in some places, uh, we have a peak temperature um, from, from the literature, from carbonation, the, the crystallization of carbonaceous material. So we have a pretty narrow range of temperature in, the, in this part of the, the mountain belt, but in the area where the viscosity was calculated here, the temperature was up closer to in the 400 degrees at some point. So I, wor I did some work called titanium and quartz thermobarometry. So in, in uh, experiment, other set of experiments, if you crystallize quartz with, in the presence of a titanium, the quartz will take on some of the titanium and, at the, and it's temperature dependent. It's also pressure dependent. So it, when it's hot, when it's hotter quartz, it can carry more titanium in it. And so that's been used in, in volcanology uh, quite a bit. Uh, but, it, you know, whether it can be applied to low temperature deformation and recrystallization of quartz is not as clear. And some, there's some cases where it seems to work, other cases where it's less clear. So this, this was an opportunity um, to explore that. So this shows a, cro a cross-polarized light image of some quartz. Here we have um, a cathode luminescence image. And you can see that, so titanium in quartz, like it lights up the quartz in, under cathode luminescence. So you have some bigger grains that are brighter, have a lot of titanium. And these are titanium measurements um, with the SIMS. And then in the areas where the recrystallization occurred, the, the titanium levels drop down and they get dark. Um, so there is some kind of, there is definitely some resetting of titanium, but whether or not that, uh, I talked to a geochemist and they were like, okay, is it, is it just you're just kind of losing it? Or is it, is, it actually is it actually coming to some kind of equilibration? And so I plotted all the data. Uh, of grain size versus uh, temp titanium, and then it's converted to temperature here. So the big grains, this is a, it's a quartzite, so there's been quartz coming from all over the place. We're getting this wide, you know, this huge range, almost like, yeah, three orders of magnitude in titanium. Uh, but then over, as deformation is reducing the grain size, it, you can see it's not only decreasing, but there, it also appears to be that some of the grains are actually taking on titanium. So this, we I use this to estimate a, uh, to narrow down the temperature range um, for these samples, and at the same time uh, demonstrate that 
uh, titanium can equilibrate during low temperature recrystallization of quartz and be useful for um, estimating temperatures of deformation. So putting, putting those constraints for titanium quartz in here, um, we get sort of a 100 degree or so window of um, uncertainty in temperature. And the next step then is, okay, so the viscosity that I calculated of 10 to the 21st was a, a, when the rocks were at around 350 degrees. So uh, one way we can present this data is on a, on a, str a stress versus depth diagram like I showed earlier. So these were the diagrams with the line and then the curve. So the, the sample depths here are, are estimated based on the, t the temperatures that were calculated. So we have an idea in Taiwan of, of the geothermal gradient, um, partly from heat flow and other, other approaches. So something like 25 degrees per kilometer, that allows us to position the rocks that, that we're finding at the surface um, when we know the temperature, we can we we know basically okay what depth they were at um, when they were deforming. So, and then on the x-axis is the stress, and that's based on the size of those recrystallized grains. So this is we're we're plotting it here for a couple of reasons, but one of them is is to uh, compare our results, compare the the stress results we got using this this tool, the recrystallized grain size piezometer, to other indep independent estimates of stress to see how consistent things are. Oops. Okay, so we can uh, create one of these strength depth profiles uh, simply by drawing a straight line to the surface from the highest stress. And the reason for that is the, the highest stresses in the crust are thought to occur Basically, as I described, you know, as pressure increases on faults, it gets stronger and stronger up to a point where the rocks get warm enough that they can start to flow. And then as it gets hotter and hotter, it gets weaker. So the, the peak stresses we find in, those, in the recrystallized grains ought to be right at that point um, where the, the, the stretching of rocks is taking over from the faulting. And so we can indicate that with drawing a friction profile there. And the first uh, comparison I can make with independent data is uh, these are in yellow and in green are two different sort of the most popular flow laws for quartz. So flow laws are, are based on a different set of experiments but in some ways similar. So if you take quartz and you uh, or they do this with olivine and feldspar and everything else. Um, heat it up and then deform it at different temperatures and, like, and see, see how, how high the stress is. And you, if you do a lot of experiments like that, you can predict, okay, if I were to do an experiment at this temperature, this is what I would see, right? And if we extrapolate those results down to lower temperatures like we have in the crust, um, we call that a flow law. And that's what you see here. Um, you say, okay, you know, at, at temperature, if we were at 600 we'd degrees, we'd estimate it wouldn't take a lot of stress for us to, to, move, to deform this quartz. And as we, in, as we decrease the temperature, it takes more and more stress. And those flow laws are, are created, you don't, e you don't even have to look at the sample. So it's a, it's, a, it's a similar experiment to what I did, but it's, it's not based on anything that you see microscopically. And those fall right along the, the curve of where we based our results from our temperature and grain size estimates. So that's reassuring. Uh, another estimate of stress can come from uh, something called critical taper theory. So critical taper theory is uh, an observation. If you've ever like shoveled snow, you might have noticed that the, like the snow kind of piles up in a sort of a wedge shape. Um, and there's, a, you know, the same thing with like a, a bulldozer, right? So it turns out that the, the angle of the wedges that form, if you make some assumptions, is a function of, and, and non, being non-cohesive is the main assumption, 
is it's a function that that angle that taper angle is a function of the um, uh, basically the strength of the of the material and the strength of the, at the base of the of the material. And so, in Taiwan, is a place is was the place one of the places where that theory was developed. And so, there's uh, there was a paper in 20, 2007 that found a relationship of between of 0.6 times density, gravity times depth of what we would what, we, what the strength should be in Taiwan. And so that that relationship is shown here. It really applies only for the the brittle part of the crust, uh, but it but it, the fact that it intersects in the neighborhood of uh, where we sort of we see the peak stresses and, and ductile deformation taking over is a good sign. And finally, uh, another approach to estimating stress in the crust is uh, at, at a large scale and sort of on an order of magnitude is um, considering the potential energy difference between areas of high elevation and areas of low elevation. Um, and so if, we, if, I, I, if you take the thickness of the crust in Taiwan versus uh, out to sea, you can use this approach to indicate that basically it's a, it's a maximum estimate. So the, the, the area of this box uh, needs to be, should be larger than the area under the, the, the profile that I've drawn here. So basically this, this blue area needs to be bigger than that purple one and it, it, does, meet, it does meet that criteria. Okay, so what I'm what I'm showing here is that the, the data that we're collecting use in, in terms of stress based on these rock samples that I collected, it, it, we're getting stress values that are entirely consistent with multiple different approaches from very different uh, sort of ways of approaching it. Um, are, we're getting good results, basically. Um, if if the stress results were off by more than something like 25% in either direction, it would be clear in this diagram that there was a problem. So the, the takeaway then from this, I think, is like, okay, we have, a, we have, we have good evidence that this tool is pretty useful. And, and there's plenty of studies exploring similar relationships with, with feldspars and olivine and so forth. And people are using this, um, but for me, this was more of a like I'm feeling a lot more confident about this this kind of work. Okay, so putting that diagram that we just looked at at the same scale as these uh, these are all sort of uh, review papers of what we think about the strength of of the crust. We see a crust. We we see we, we see a weak lower crust, so that's, this is indicating like a lower crust that could, that could flow fairly easily, not, not this kind of thing. Strengths that are quite a bit stronger than estimated for other tectonically active regions. Um, but, but for me, I think what's most interesting is like, okay, if this is, look at the differences in different ideas about continental strength. The sensitivity of this is, is clearly good enough to distinguish, you know, if we were to go to some areas and collect similar samples and make a, a basically a survey, we, sh we ought to be able to tell the difference between these things. We can look at xenoliths, um, we can look at um, exhumed rocks, uh, and that can help us in understanding crustal dynamics. So this is an example of, mod so modelers use these stresses quite a bit, um, to create, you know, numerical recreations of, of mountain building and subduction and all this kind of stuff. And this was a case where I found, for, where I found for Taiwan, where the, the author, authors came to the end of their paper and they said, okay, we basically, we got two, two scenarios that, that the, either of these could be the case. And if you look at the stress measurements in this one, they're, they're off, they're off, they're way higher than they, they're the ones we're actually seeing. So I have, um, I, I find it really hard to talk to modelers. Um, it's almost like they're speaking a different language. But there's like there's a lot of potential here um, 
to use the, the sort of direct observations of these rocks um, to help us better understand crustal dynamics. Okay, and I'm just going to finish up with an, uh, something I'm working on currently. Uh, so I'm using the same approach. I, I collected a, a number of samples in New Zealand, and I mined their. They they actually. Um, so this was a kind of a revelation to me. They had the funding to to sustain a a rock and thin section library that is you know over a hundred years old. So the, the basement of, of the University in Otago has, is filled with all these samples. And I went down there and I just got a bunch of samples from the Alpine Fault, um, measured the quartz grain size, which is in gray for, I think I looked at 250 samples that had quartz, and then averaged the recrystallized grain size, which has the big black dots. And there's, there's clearly a trend of so the central, central New Zealand is uplifting very quickly and it has a, it's, it's pulled the geothermal gradient up with it. And that's, that's shown here, this is a model, these are earthquake data from, from the same the geographic locations up and down. Right, so in the central area, there's a lot of exhumation. There's a, there's a ton of rain, it erodes the rocks away, They're get, it's basically getting sucked up. Um, and that pulls the heat up with them. And you can see in, in the areas where that's happening that you have a coarser grain size than you do um, either to the, to the south or the north. And so that's just kind of a cool result. So we're seeing in the rocks an at the surface an indication of what's going on in terms of the, the, the strength. The strength of the rocks uh, is like half the strength it would be to the north and south. And that's been predicted in models. Um, but actually seeing the evidence of it from in the rocks is cool. And I think another application of this is we can, we can use like a drill, uh, we can use rocks from a, a sedimentary basin or a drill core to looking at these characteristics, figure out, well, what point in time did this, this, this configuration happen? When, when did the, the high mountains start to actually move up at, at a high rate? Um, so that's uh, just kind of an idea I was, haven't tried it yet, but I think it's, it's a, sort of a proposal in the, in the works. It, a way we can use this data to, to talk more, it's like a, it's a new data set that can give us some perspective on bigger geological questions. Um, like when did the thermal regime in this area change? Okay, so in, to uh, conclude here, some of the main points, uh, Crustal rheology is like a very important topic that's not well understood. Um, natural, active, natural, ac actively deforming areas provide a nice opportunity to understand rheology better using natural samples. As far as the, the, the stress estimates, we don't necessarily need the rocks to be deforming at a steady state. The stress estimates seem fairly accurate. Um, and there's a lot of potential to use them um, that hasn't been realized in terms of constraining uh, uh, different geodynamic scenarios. And then uh, in terms of the temperature estimates, uh, we find equilibration of titanium and quartz, it would appear at low temperatures. And uh, Taiwan's strength falls sort of in the, in the middle between different estimates that have been made previously of of crustal strength for active areas and continents. Thank you. Okay, we have some time for questions. Um, and if any students wanted to start us off. Uh, yeah, Alex, that's a question. My name is Alex Sisterko. So the example that you gave from Taiwan was based on quartz so it's like modern mineral uh, rock. What about if uh, was it done on heterogeneous rock with like a lot of phases and would the weight of paleophysiology the same for different minerals? You, you, there's different relationships for different minerals. 
But you always need a fairly pure, at least a part of the rock needs to be fairly pure, whatever mineral that is. Um, because the grains need to be able to change size. So if, they're, if, if, the, if the calcite you're looking at is, is next to, is surrounded by other things, it can't change its size. So that's the main constraint is it, it, whatever, it, you need to either have a fairly, you need a fewer, fairly pure layer or lens or, or part of a, a rock to do it. So it's hard to constrain because there are like a few minerals. Yeah, if you just like have a, and in, in this it occurred in the Alpine Fault, when you get close to the fault, the, the, the grains are all mixed up um, and you can't do, you can't use this technique at all. You have to find little chunks of quartz. Trying to th uh, which, which fig? Yeah, a little louder. I don't think anybody online can hear you. Was it this one? Should I repeat the question? Please. Uh, no, it's back. Yeah, it's over there. <laughs> it was probably. Say when. <laughs> I think it wasn't, it must have been in there somewhere. But yeah, go ahead and repeat the question. Maybe I'll um, understand. Yeah, for the strength yeah, diagram, this is near the end. I was just wondering like, how long was the like, scale to complete the graph? Is it in seconds to kind of see how long the peak differential stress is? Or is it like an hour or years? Um, I think I could probably best answer that. So the question is about the length of time that the rocks are at, at different stresses. And I think, I didn't talk about this diagram much, but this is probably the one. Um, so we have uh, information about the rates of cooling. That's, uh, this, isn't the, uh, this is not the right slide. Um, the short answer is people like to assume that the, the length of time is on the sort of million year time scale. But I don't actually think that is, there's a possibility that, this, that some of this recrystallization is happening on a much faster sort of earthquake time scale. And it, the, but the, the bias in the community is like, oh, these are rocks to form slowly over millions of years. Um, but there's an increasing number of studies that are kind of isolating places where it's like, actually, this, this feature requires so much stress, it had to be associated with kind of a seismic pulse and that's we're talking more like days weeks kind of time um, okay. Thank but, yeah. You. yeah yeah uh, with your wedge shape uh, diagram mm -hmm. the yeah uh, I noticed there was uh, distance or the uh, sea level depth the sea level affect geology at all so so the, the, yeah, what's the effect of, of uh, basically fl water and water pressure? And that does have a big effect, actually. If um, the way it comes in is, is into this is even, even trying to distinguish what we call hydrostatic pressure from lithostatic pressure. So if, if you have, if there's a, a, a connected pores and crack space going down, then the water will be at a lower pressure. It'll be basically just like it was under, you know, under the sea. But sometimes those cracks and pores seal off and they get compressed to, so the, so the fluid is at the same pressure as the rocks. And that, that creates very, very different, um, if, if you have those high pressures of fluid, it makes uh, friction move happen a lot, much more easier. And that can totally change the, um, you know, when, I, when I'm drawing a diagram like this and, and drawing these things, if you, if you have a different fluid pressure, you're, you know, you're, uh, the lines you draw can be considerably different based on that. So that's a, that's a big uncertainty um, in, in, this, in this kind of work. I think, I think we've used, I think we've, 
I'm trying to remember. I think we have, generally it's assumed that, that the cracks and pores are interconnected and you have hydrostatic pressure, but who knows? So, so that figure is up there. Why are you using a geothermal gradient of 25 degrees per kilometer for Taiwan? Isn't it a bit hotter? Uh, it's been a while since I thought about that, but I'm sure we used the best one that we, the best estimate that we, that we had. Um, I don't know that, I mean, obviously in some areas there's volcanic activity where it'd be a lot hotter, um, but there's multiple, um, I mean, it's, it's, so 25 is typical continent, right? But you also have a subducting plate coming under it, which cool thing, cools things down. So you don't really expect it to be substantially uh, hotter than, than a continent. And it hasn't been happening that long. The, the collision is only five or six million years old. So there's not been enough time to really dramatically change the geotherm from sedimentary basin, where it was 30 million years ago. There's also, I also checked against um, the carbonate. There's sedimentary layers where they're, they've um, used the, the recrystallization of carbonaceous material thermometer. And so you can look at like, how does that change with, with, with paleo depth in those. So I, there was a, a couple of different approaches I took. I don't remember the details of it, but. Um, can we read it? The question was, why did we use uh, 25 kilometer geotherm? Okay, there's a question. Oh, okay, great. From Roy, it says, you briefly mentioned that Christchurch earthquake and the um, Tofu quake came as surprises to the folks in New Zealand and Japan. Can you elaborate on this a little? Um, yeah, the magnet, I mean, obviously Japan knew about earthquakes, um, but the, the sort of consensus was that in that area, there won't be one that big. And that's why the, the tsunami walls were the level that they were. There was evidence, I think, in a monast... There was like a, a paper that, had, that showed some historical record in a monastery of like, oh, the, the tsunami actually came up to this level. Like, so there was, a, there was some awareness in the, among the geologists that, that those estimates in the that Tohoshu Boku area were inadequate. Um, so that was known, but the sort of the bigger, broader seismological community um, just didn't think that that magnitude could, could occur in that location. Um, and as far as Christchurch in New Zealand, the ex, the, they have their, I talked about the Alpine Fault. So the Alpine Fault is basically like, it's like their San Andreas Fault. It's like a, it's a plate boundary fault um, it's, a, it's active, it has, we know that there's repeating large earthquakes. Um, uh, and so that's, there's a lot of attention on that as being, okay, that's the thing that we're worried about. Um, there hadn't been an earthquake like that historically in the eastern side of the South Island and they weren't ready for it. And I don't think they saw it, they saw it coming. I think there are more questions, but we should, I think, wrap up. Okay. And thank the speaker again. Thanks, Steve.